This season of RLCS has gotten off to an exciting start, with teams going at each other for the coveted spots at the Fall Major, the first RLCS land competition in two years. In this young season, some teams have been really good, and some teams have been not so good. But we've also had some teams who have been both good and bad, and today I'm going to focus on a couple of those teams. In the first two regionals, FaZe and Vitality had one good performance and one bad one. So let's take a look at what may have caused this variance, and talk about what went well and what went badly for these teams in the first two events. In my season preview, I talked about how FaZe had enough talent to win games, regardless of whether or not the chemistry was there. And with their first place finish in the first regional, they had already put that talent on display. They were able to consistently pull out close wins in the bracket against other top level teams in Envy, Space Station, and NRG. The offensive production was split pretty evenly between First Killer and AJ, having similar stats across the board, and spending nearly the exact same amount of time as a player furthest forward on the field. And while Illusion was, as expected, the most defensive player on the team, he wasn't too far behind his teammates in terms of stats, and he provided enough pressure himself to ensure that defenses could never get too comfortable regardless of who had the ball. But the individual skill that I kept alluding to was critical for them to pick up these three wins, where they faced off against who I believe are the three best defenses in the region. Against the great defenses like these, a lot of the time offensive cohesion isn't enough to get goals, because no matter how great your passes are, or how well positioned you are on offense, teams that are this good on defense can be prepared for whatever team plays the offense throws at them, and you'll often need a flash of individual brilliance to crack them open. If you have someone sitting middle for an infield pass, they probably have someone nearby ready to cut it out. You have a guy leaking downfield waiting to get a redirect shot from a clear, someone has already rotated back and is blocking the passing lane. As long as they have the boost needed to reach the ball, a good defense can be prepared for almost any team play, because no matter how you're positioned on offense, the defense will know where you are, and they'll set themselves up in the right area to deny any potential threats. That doesn't mean that coordinated offensive attacks and solid positioning aren't needed. Far from it, in fact. Offensive cohesion from the team is still just as important as the crazy solo plays, and probably even more so, but I'll address that in a bit. But on the other hand, if the offense has a player who's able to take the ball and beat multiple defenders on his own, they'll be able to break through the defense even easier. Because no matter how well positioned you are on defense, there's not much you can do if one guy is able to make the whole team look silly and get a game-breaking goal or assist. And the great thing for FaZe is that they have two different players who consistently pull out plays like this in First Killer and AJ. And with every series during that bracket stage being so close for FaZe during Regional 1, these great individual plays proved to be the difference in these matches and gave them the edge that they needed to beat these teams. Here are a couple of quick examples. After a 50 in the midfield with Atomic, the ball bounces out to the right side and First Killer immediately takes flight after it. The area in front of goal is completely covered by Envy players, with Atomic on the near post, Turbo on the far post, and Miss sitting in goal. So if the ball goes anywhere in that area, Envy will be able to easily take possession of it. And even if First Killer tried to fake the touch and leave it for AJ, Atomic is in the perfect area to cut it out before it even gets to him. So instead, First Killer jumps up, angles his car, and gets a perfect redirect shooting the ball into the top corner of the goal getting it past Miss, who's sitting on the goal line directly underneath where the shot came in. And Miss is one of the best defenders in the game, so he can save almost anything that comes his way. But the speed and perfect placement of the shot ensures that not even he can reach it. And AJ showed off his skills with one of his signature air dribbles, starting it from his own defensive half after picking up the corner boost. He taps the ball up and takes light after it, matching the horizontal speed of the ball perfectly to stay directly under it. And then he gets one more touch on the ball in the air, giving it even more height off the ground. Garrett has jumped up to contest this play, but with AJ getting the ball so far up, Garrett isn't even close to making a play on it by the time it's past him. At this point, all of AJ's boost is gone, and he's too far under it to go for a double tap. So instead of going for the next touch himself, he leans away from the ball and lets it bounce off the backboard for one of his teammates to follow up on it. And lucky for him, he even gets a bump on Squishy, who jumped up on defense trying to read the backboard bounce himself. With AJ taking two players out of the game single-handedly, First Killer is able to come in and secure the easy goal. Also, as a side note, one thing that helps them create more spaces and opportunities for solo plays are demos, which FaZe gets a lot of. As a team, they had the most demos during both Regional 1 and Regional 2, including having way more demos than second place in Regional 2, due in part to FaZe's first series against RBG, where Illusion had 30 demos in the series, including a record-setting 18 in Game 2. And if you're curious about how you could possibly get 18 demos in 5 minutes, I'll take the next 30 seconds to show you exactly how that happens. But feel free to skip ahead once you get the point.
But during that event, when they weren't blowing up every defender in their path, they were losing pretty decisively, taking 3-1 losses to Space Station and Envy, two teams they had just beaten in the previous event, and getting swept by True Neutral. These losses showed exactly why miraculous solo plays are so hard to rely on, and why coordinated team offense will always be needed. While solo plays are always an effective way to break down even the strongest of defenses, they are very hard to pull off, even for the best players in the world, making them low percentage plays and an unreliable way to put points on the board. This unreliability showed up in FaZe's shooting percentage, where for the whole event they shot around 19%, which was in the bottom half of all teams, but this number was skewed upwards by their match against RBG. Against better teams they played, they shot far worse, including shooting around 13% against Space Station, 11% against Envy, and even as low as 9% against True Neutral. When FaZe weren't getting these pop-off highlight plays, they struggled to put the ball in the back of the net against these top-level teams. And this is why team cohesion matters so much for the truly great offensive teams. While many teams have players that are able to go for mechanical solo plays as well, you'll often see them take basic shots to force the defense to make saves, controlling their positioning by forcing them into the net, which frees up other parts of the field, which the offense can then move into when they reposition for their next offensive push. And in many cases, the offense steals boost away from the defenders, making it even harder for them to stop the continued pressure. The basic shots from the offense become harder to defend against, while they're also generating more scoring opportunities in general. And once the defense can't keep up anymore, the offense scores. And as I'm always saying, this is something that G2 does perfectly. And when you can add the crazy solo plays to this consistent offensive pressure, is when the team starts to turn into an unstoppable offensive force. FaZe hadn't yet reached the point where they could consistently generate this type of pressure against top level teams, and as a result, their offensive performance suffered in these matchups. While they led Regional 2 in shots per game as a team with 9.83, this is again skewed by their games against RBG, because they fell way short of that shot total in their matchups against Space Station and True Neutral getting only 7.33 shots per game against True Neutral and 7.25 against Space Station, both of which would have been 14th out of the 16 teams in the event. And while they did manage 11 shots per game against Envy, they're a team that's comfortable taking on pressure anyways, and they look to score more often off counterattacks, which they did against FaZe to perfection. So they play a bit more conservatively on defense at times, which allows offenses to get extra shots. So it could be argued that this high shot tally for FaZe was just as much of a good thing for Envy as it was for them. In these matches, they had a lot of what I'll call one and done possessions, where they bring the ball up on the offensive half, create one scoring chance maybe, and then the defense gets the ball and immediately takes it back to the other side and puts FaZe back on defense. Sustaining offensive pressure is essential for great teams, and in this event, FaZe didn't do that nearly enough for them to have reliable success on offense. So to summarize, in the games where they lost, they failed to generate many scoring chances, and they also failed to score consistently off the chances that they did create. But as the team gets more time together and more comfortable with each other's tendencies and how they can best accommodate one another, I think we'll start to see these issues fade away. Now let's hop over to Europe and take a look at another team who's been up and down this season in Vitality. Unlike FaZe who got off to a hot start and then cooled off in the second regional, Vitality started off about as slowly as you can, getting swept out of regional 1 by 0-0 Nation, Giants, and Evil Geniuses. Then after getting together to boot camp for regional 2, they managed to make it all the way to the grand finals where they lost to Dignitas, who were ridiculously in form. But even when Vitality has the rough patches as a team, including last season there are some bad showings in the spring split, Alpha 54 is consistently a bright spot and is usually making enough plays to give his team a decent chance of victory. He finished third in Octane rating during both events this season and put up a great stat line each time. But one of the main problems that Vitality had during the first regional is that Fairy Peak didn't play nearly as well as we've come to expect from him. Firstly, he was hardly involved in the offense at all, coming in dead last for all players in terms of Octane rating and having a poor all-around stat line as well. But while you'd never expect his stats to be this low, I wouldn't consider this by itself to be enough evidence that he played poorly. Fairy Peak is the primary midfield defender for Vitality, always trying to stay near the ball and not letting opponents get too comfortable on offense. And he neutralizes threats by winning 50s and effectively clearing the ball. But these aren't plays that show up in the stats, so even when he is playing well, he's usually not going to have the individual stats to show for it. So in order to get a better picture of how he played, you have to look at the film. And here we'll see a couple of plays from the first regional where you would expect Fairy Peak to make a solid play on the ball, but instead, he makes a mistake that directly leads to a goal. The first that we'll look at happened against 0-0 Nation, where the ball is sent up over Vitality's backboard and threatens to roll straight down in front of their goal. So Fairy Peak jumps up, looking to clear it before that happens. But before he's able to reach the ball, it bounces off the curve between the ceiling and the back wall, completely changing direction and throwing off his read. So now, instead of clearing the ball with his touch, he only gets a glancing touch on it, which sends it out into the midfield, serving as a perfect pass to Flame, who slots it in after Hips bumps Alpha out of the way. And while this is a hard read to make, this is something that Fairy Peak pulls off pretty consistently. And it's the type of play that he needs to make for Vitality to have the success that everyone expects out of them. 
Another example happened against the Giants, where the ball is coming down to Ferry in front of their goal after a 50 on the wall. He has Dementor closing in on him to apply pressure, because someone on the Giants is always doing that, and to make matters worse, Kedop is also committing on this ball after rotating back, which puts more unnecessary pressure on Ferry's touch. The best case scenario here is to have the clear stick as close to the back wall as possible, which would make the follow-up touch for the Giants farther and more difficult, but instead, he sends the ball out to the side and straight to Atomic. With it, Atomic takes one touch and throws a simple infield pass to Dementa, who scores the goal. These types of misplays from Fairy Peak were a huge reason for the team's struggles in the first event. But in the next one, these mistakes were almost non-existent, and the difference in Fairy's midfield defense between the two regionals shows up in the team stats, where they went from allowing just over 9 shots per game in the first regional to just over 8 in the second, decreasing their average by over 1 shot per game. And more importantly, they went from allowing opponents to make 26% of their shots down to allowing them to only make 17.5%, going from dead last in that stat to third. And these two stats are due largely to Fairy Peak's midfield defense, where he shut down more opponents' plays before they developed into a shot. But if they did turn into shots, he was better at buying time for his teammates to rotate back from their offensive pushes and get in position to make saves on the shots when they came in. I know I've only talked about Fairy Peak so far in regards to Vitaly's poor performance, but I have to say that he was not the only reason that the team struggled. Everybody had areas where they could've and should've done better. With Fairy Peak playing more passively as the primary defender in the midfield, most of the offensive burden falls to Kadop and Alpha. But in the first regional, they left some goals on the board, either because of poor decision making or poor finishing. So when regional 2 came around, their offensive game plan took a bit of a turn. Ever since Alpha came to Vitality, he has been their primary passer, leading the team in assists and getting the ball to his teammates for good scoring looks. But on top of his great passing, he would be right there with KDOP for the team's top goal scorer, even having slightly more goals per game than KDOP during RLCSX. But in the second regional, KDOP and Fairy Peak took Alpha's playmaking responsibility and split it evenly between them. And this change caused Alpha to go from being neck and neck with KDOP as the team's top scorer to easily surpassing him, and having more goals in this event than KDOP and Fairy Peak combined, while also having the third most out of all players in the event. And what's funny about this change is that they didn't even need to change too much about their playstyles individually to make these adjustments. Alpha was still the primary ball handler, having the most time on the team as closest to the ball, as he always has, and Kadop was still the player that would hang back and try to follow up on plays that Alpha initiated, shown in the stats by him having the most time as farthest from the ball on the team. And Fairy Peak was of course still the primary midfield defender, shutting down opponents' possessions before they got started. The change, however, is that this time when Vitality was on offense, Fairy Peak and Kadop would look to enable Alpha in whatever way they could, whether it was passing the ball to him whenever he found open space, or bumping defenders out of the way. Vitality's game plan for Regional 2 seemed to be doing whatever they could to get Alpha better scoring chances. And his efficiency improved as a result, going from shooting only 17% in the first Regional to almost 26% in the second. This play shows a perfect example of the team using bumps to enable Alpha. As soon as Alpha pops the ball up for the air dribble, KDOP and Ferry immediately look for demos to give Alpha extra space, resulting in one of the most coordinated demo plays you'll ever see. And after his first demo, Ferry Peak decides that he wants more so he turns off ball cam and drives straight at Oli. This makes what would have been a somewhat difficult save almost impossible, and Oli is unable to both avoid Fairy Peak and make the save, and Alpha gets the goal. And for the passing, there were no better examples than these two transition passes from KDOP against Carmine Core, where he found Alpha downfield for two different redirect goals. The first was pretty simple. Alpha loses the 50, but instead of rotating back, he stays downfield, occupying the space that Carmine vacated for their offensive push. The ball goes down to Kadop, and he sees Alpha wide open downfield. He beats Steak and Itachi to the ball, going directly between them and passing the ball up to Alpha, who gets an easy redirect goal. But the second one in the next game has a bit more difficulty. The setup is the same, with Alpha losing the 50 and staying upfield while the ball goes back to Kadop. But this time, instead of the net being wide open, Alpha has defenders on each side of him. But despite that, Kadop still recognizes the passing opportunity and throws it up to Alpha, who drives back towards the pass and he hits it off the back side of the top of his car during the flip, redirecting it on target and placing it near the far post just outside of the reach of Itachi, securing yet another highlight goal. The strategy of enabling Alpha as much as possible worked perfectly for Vitality, and I expect him to keep that up moving forward. Alright, outro time. I haven't been posting as much as I've wanted to since the season started, but I'm going to change that. So from here on out, I'm going to be dropping one video every week on the channel, and I'm putting it on record so I have to follow through with that. I'll be back next week. Thanks for watching.